Welcome to WordPress Accessibility Day. My name is Carrie Dills, and I'm a freelance WordPress developer and instructor. And I appreciate you joining me for this session, Overlays Underwhelm with Adrian Roselli. Adrian has written articles for trade journals, websites, and participated as an author and editor on five books. In 1998, he co-founded a software development consulting firm before leaving at the start of 2016. He was a member of the W3C Web Platform Working Group, W3C ARIA Working Group, and W3C Accessibility Task Force. Some may recognize Adrian from his days helping to run evolt.org, one of the first communities for web developers. Adrian has been developing for the web since 1993. That is so awesome. I'm excited to have you, Adrian. If anybody has questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A tab of Slido, and you can use that idea section to chat with other attendees. So welcome, Adrian. Hi there. Um, thanks for having me. I, I guess I just start going. All right, cool. Um, so the title of this talk is Overlays Underwhelm. I had the title a bit before I had the content, so I'm trying to shoehorn this over under theme into the talk throughout. Uh, thanks to the magic of one-way audio, I will not hear your grunts of disapproval. This is a good thing. Um, I include this ego slide to give you the barest indication that I have some experience. You already heard a bunch of this, though. Um, I want my arguments to stand on the merit, but I understand you want to know my chops. So business, books, sites, articles, et cetera. You can look me up to confirm all of this stuff, of course. So now into the meat of the talk. Uh, we should consider what gaps accessibility overlays are filling. The web has lots of accessibility bits built in already. There are more tools and features available to developers and users than ever before. After all, as Tim Berners-Lee said, quote, the B4520 gets you there faster and bypasses that nasty roundabout outside Swindon, end quote. I also may have that quote wrong. Let's first ask, what is an overlay? An overlay is a tool that provides some sort of accessibility or usability feature that may not be built into the underlying site. Sometimes it replicates native features, and sometimes it offers some other affordance. Often it does the work in the end user's browser, relying on each user's computer to replicate the same work as every other user's computer. They can also be referred to as widgets, toolbars, or add-ons. There were many tools that predated native features or that were created to fill gaps in technology, including assistive technology. Some techniques and standards may not have been defined or even well supported when these tools were created. The risk is that these tools required users to learn them anew for every site with features that would not carry across sites. Uh, this might be loud. I'm hoping not. Browse Aloud is an early example. It converts the text on a page to speech. Fluency Tutor, Orbit Note, for work, read and write. So this, as you can see or hear, offers no context for what is being read, visible or not. It was never meant to replicate screen readers. Instead, it's akin to a feature you can find built into browsers today, such as Edge's Immersive Reader. Browse Aloud requires a third-party embedded script and back in 2018 was briefly hacked to mine cryptocurrencies. Some widgets made an effort to replicate features already in browsers and operating systems. These ranged from text sizing to contrast and lightness to motion control and even zooming and magnification. This text sizing widget shows how they can go wrong, is no longer available on the site. Assuming you could find it behind a gear icon, the control only appeared when you were at the top of the page. The widget only resized article content, not headlines, not navigation, nothing else. Since that article content was outside the viewport, it also made it near impossible to compare sizing options. It does not retain the size as you navigate the site and when you return to the site or even for the print styles. Better implementations have shown users how to change their browser or operating systems instead. However, this could be a useful stopgap feature to gauge if users regularly scale text 
and perhaps adjust those defaults on your site as a result. Some widgets exist because there is no native equivalent or the needs are not well, not well represented in what exists. Success of those widgets comes down to how well they perform. HandTalk is another add-on. It will load an animated avatar to sign the content of a page. Like the text-to-speech example earlier, it presents the content of the page in sign language. It still cannot offer the same context for what content is associated with what other content, so the user may need to also read along. I did not explore how many sign languages it supports. To its credit, it is not fingerspelling everything it encounters, but I leave it to the audience to judge its value. The current list of overlay vendors is not necessarily filling these gaps, however. They are capitalizing on a general lack of understanding of people and needs, focusing on selling quick fixes to businesses instead. These companies include Accessibi, Accessaway, Ad Alley, AudioEye, Redacted, Facility, Max Access, Pelota AI, Purple Lens, Redacted, and UserWay. There are also vendors that white label some of these products. Overlays tend to overstate their abilities. In technical reviews, they consistently underperform. Automated accessibility testing tools are not perfect, but we can use them to get a sense of whether or not an overlay has improved WCAG compliance of a page. I used an automated checker to compare the number of errors before and after an overlay was activated. The page had more detectable WCAG errors after. The examples that follow are about a year old. I opted not to retest because I have no interest in providing free testing. Besides, these vendors were claiming WCAG compliance when I tested, so if they were lying then, there's no reason to assume they would stop now. DQ's Axe browser plugin prides itself on no false positives. As a result, it may be more lenient than a human tester would be. After running an overlay on the vendor's own page, the number of detectable errors identified by Axe tripled from 4 to 12. TPGI's Arc Toolkit plugin is less likely to be lenient. When testing the same page, the number of detectable errors doubled, jumping from 19 to 38 when the overlay was activated. Arc also jumped from 164 warnings to 193. These do not represent clear WCAG violations, but instead warrant some form of manual testing. WebAIM's WaveChecker browser plugin returned no violations without the overlay active. After the overlay was activated, a single contrast violation appeared. I've written about my concerns that Accessibility was spoofing Wave, though I cannot wade into that code to confirm this. Wave used to display a message, quote, the third-party Accessibility integration on this page may temporarily modify content when Wave is activated, resulting in interference with Wave's detection of and accuracy identifying accessibility and compliance issues, end quote. We know that automated accessibility testing tools only identify about 30% of issues. That number shifts based on complexity and other factors. That 30% number acknowledges that much of WCAG requires human judgment based on context. Overlay vendors claim they can address the other 70%. That is a bold claim. It is also easy to disprove. The Stop Animations button on this overlay fails to stop the auto-playing background video. To compound the confusion, the button changes only its accessible name when pressed. It does not use ARIA Press to indicate it has been activated. That brief flash you saw was simply from the YouTube video looping. I tried the keyboard navigation feature of one vendor. Since its unaddressed navigation violates 1.4.13 content on hover and 2.4.7 focus visible. Even after I activate the feature, focus styles are still missing. Eventually a new box appears with different links. I was tabbing so much already, I tabbed past the item that displayed the instructions. To drive home the point, it drops me into a de facto keyboard trap in its cookie pop-up. It's not just the claimed fixes that do not work. The tools themselves present barriers. The button in the background video is one example. In other cases, screen reader users have noted they hear sounds from the overlay with no explanation what they mean. The tools don't even prevent their own customer from making new WCAG violations. Here, the overlay is very tall, so this image captures four screenfuls. 
it shows how the contrast of the controls is so light, it is hard to determine if one is active or at what degree it is active. Some of the text and icons are illegible. The language selector, which commits the internationalization sin of using flags to choose language, provides no alt attributes for those flags. The overlay violates its th at least three WCAG success criteria from just a few seconds of examination. Part of this is because the configuration options for the overlay customer do not prevent them from choosing colors that clearly fail contrast checks. Here, the white text on the pink white background has a contrast ratio of 1.2 to one. The overlay vendor allowed its customer to do this. Here we can see that the browser's default focus ring is active, but then the browser alert prompting the user to activate the overlay appears. If the user declines, that focus ring is somehow removed. The only clue that focus is changing is in the browser status bar or when the page eventually jumps to scroll down. Here I navigate an overlay vendor's site and as the new page is loading, it grays itself as if a modal will appear and then some hidden audio starts playing. Hi, I'm Ronnie from Accessory, the number one fully automated ADA and WCAG compliant solution. In this video, we will learn how Accessory's AI-powered technology makes any website accessible and compliant with the WCAG 2.1, the ADA. So you could see uh, potentially that I clicked on the gray in the hopes that maybe a hidden video modal would disappear. I scrolled around the page looking for player controls. I also hit the escape key with no luck. The page itself is a good example of a 1.4.2 audio control violation and 1.2.1 audio only and video only pre-recorded violation. Here is an overlay button trigger with an icon of a paper boat or a hat um, and the visible text customized accessibility. The browser dev tools indicate it has focus but thanks to an outline none important, there is no visible style. So that's a 2.4.7 focus visible failure. The boat icon image also, um, sorry, the boat icon image has alt text. The alt text does not describe the image. Instead, it reads manage display settings. That feels like a 1.1.1 non-text content failure to me. That makes the full accessible name of the button quote, manage display settings, customized accessibility, end quote. But the button has an ARIA label reading facility colon adapt display, which overrides the text we can see, which is a 2.5.3 label and name failure. That's three WCAG failures on the button that triggers the accessibility features from the overlay vendor. The following examples are from Accessibility. The reason Accessibility is more prominent in my tweets and posts is because it seems to be the loudest at using its venture funding to promote its product. It took a year for Accessibility to update the terms on its site after I flagged these. I have no idea what terms are written into their contracts, um, certainly not now, and those contracts may retain this language. Other vendors have made similar compliance promises and may have similarly mooted those promises in their terms. From the Accessibility homepage, does Accessibility protect me from lawsuits? Absolutely. Accessibility turns inaccessible websites into WCAG and ADA compliant websites. But not only that, Accessibility provides you with a litigation support package in case you need to prove your ADA website compliance and guides you through the process. Another one from the homepage. Does Accessibility cover all accessibility requirements? Yes! Exclamation mark. Accessibility covers the WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, version 2.1 at the AA level success criteria, and in certain areas, even level AAA. This is a step beyond what legislation requires. But that is different from the Accessibility Terms and Conditions page, here captured from December 2020. In this section, Accessibility is defining the word standard to mean specifically, quote, WCAG 2.1 level AA success criteria, end quote. From the Accessibility terms, quote, the functionality of the Accessibility systems requires that the licensee website in which they are embedded be websites based solely on HTML files and tags, and that the source code be written according to the standard of the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, without any errors or validation warning in W3C's troubleshooting inspections. 
Please note that licensee changes to such website may impact the functionality of the service. By way of example, Accessibility Systems do not support other components such as Canvas, Flash, and or SVG, end quote. Essentially, Accessibility states that its customer websites must already meet the standard, which we confirmed is defined as WCAG 2.1 AA, with no errors or even warnings from the validator. Again, essentially, your site must be WCAG compliant to conform to Accessibility's terms for a product guaranteeing to make your site WCAG compliant. Accessibility then goes on to exempt PDFs, Flash, SVG files, and even any mobile devices not running Android 8 or iOS 10. To remind you that Accessibility is not the only one making these claims, here is UserWay's site. It says it will make your site ADA compliant, which is not a thing. It brags about the lack of lawsuits mentioning it. It claims to have a strong reputation in the disability community. It asserts its privacy chops. And it claims it is secure by not tracking people with disabilities. I do not have a LexisNexis subscription to confirm UserWay's claim about lawsuits, but I know Yield Street was unable to use UserWay to get its lawsuit dismissed. However, I can say that many lawsuits do not name the overlay vendor. Many of these vendors claim they can protect their customers from lawsuits. Accessibility CEO has even written, quote, never, not once, had encountered a company that got sued because of Accessibility, end quote. Yet in 2020, over 250 companies were sued after investing in overlays. The lawsuit pace picked up to almost one per day by the end of the year. Here are just five examples, at least one of which mentioned the vendor by name. Four of them mention Accessibility, despite its CEO's claims. Uh, they are Colasar versus uh, Byatt LLC, Thomas Klaus and Robert Chahota versus Upright Technologies, Blair Douglas versus Masterbuilt Manufacturing LLC, Murphy versus iBobs LLC, Fischler et al. versus Dorai Homes, and Lighthouse et al. versus ADP. The Lighthouse uh, ADP case goes further and explicitly states that, quote, for the purpose of this agreement, overlay solutions such as those currently provided by companies such as AudioEye and Accessibility will not suffice to achieve accessibility, end quote. The iBobs case concluded in a settlement where iBobs has to create an accessibility team, perform an audit, adopt a policy statement, implement an accessibility strategy, and provide accessibility training. The overlay did not protect iBobs. Wired wrote an article uh, titled, This Company Tapped AI for Its Website and Landed in Court. I'm going to read a bit from the article now. In a statement, Accessibility's head of marketing, Gil Magan, said the company had analyzed iBob's website and found it complied with the accessibility standards. Accessibility offers clients assistance with litigations, but iBob declined, the statement said. In its own statement, iBob said Accessibility failed to respond to requests for meetings with its lawyers. Quote, iBob's is no longer working with Accessibility, nor will we in the future, end quote, the statement said. Sometimes a company relies on the overlay as its only way to become accessible to customers. But what happens when the script will not load? Malware Bytes has blocked them. Ad blockers have blocked them. Firefox enhanced privacy protection blocks them. What if the script has an error or the network chunks? Is your site, quote, protected, end quote? Are the users helped? This screenshot of browser dev tools shows that the overlay script has not loaded. Worse, that accessibility link in the footer is just a div with a tab index and a button roll. It does nothing else when clicked because the overlay script is supposed to replace it with a real control. On the Malware Bytes forum, a user wanted to know if the script from an overlay vendor was a tracker or not. The Malware Bytes staff acknowledged it had been blocked. Until the user asked the question, Malware Bytes had blocked the overlay for all its customers for potentially years. The claims of no privacy risk are spurious at best. A data Protection Impact Assessment, or DPIA, is a process to help you identify and minimize the data protection risks of a project. 
you must do a DPIA for processing information that is likely to result in a high risk to individuals. The vendors do not provide one. As a result, any claimed GDPR compliance is in question. Remember that these overlay scripts must parse all the content on the page, essentially reading what you are surfing. Some of them keep your settings from site to site by setting tracking cookies. Here in a tweet, Leone Watson demonstrates how cavalierly overlay vendors treat this compliance. The tweet, quote, hello, Accessibility. I've asked you by DM and by phone for a copy of your data protection impact assessment and you have not responded. Since asking discreetly has not worked, I am now asking openly for you to share your DPIA since you claim GDPR conformance. Thank you, end quote. She asked on April 1st, 2021 and has still not heard back and it has been more than a year. I'm not a lawyer, but this might be a GDPR violation. The DSW site uses Redacted's assistive overlay though instead of an accessibility icon in the corner, it uses the text, quote, enable accessibility, end quote, in gray on gray located in the header. If you block third-party cookies, you get the following browser alert when you try to activate it. An embedded page at a40.redacted.com says, your web browser privacy settings are preventing the accessibility mode to stay enabled. Try enabling third-party cookies to ensure you receive accessible updates to the website. This presents a false choice between security and what may be a more accessible experience. Nowhere does the user have the opportunity to understand how those third-party cookies will be used, what information will be shared. Essentially, a user has to disclose a disability or access need with no indication how that information will persist. It is also a reminder that these products don't make a site more accessible. Instead, these products make your company, I'm sorry, Instead, these products make your computer try to make a site less broken. In August 2022, the Federal Trade Commission announced an advance notice of proposed rulemaking for a rule on commercial surveillance and data security. I left a comment specifically about the non-HIPAA health data to which overlays have access, along with my concern that they can sell it to data brokers. Since 99.98% of Americans can be identified from an anonymized data set with only 15 data points, this should be a genuine concern, and I hope the FTC treats it as such. Overlay vendors will overpromise in their marketing, making claims about their utility and popularity while under-delivering on them. These vendors rely on a combination of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They know how many website owners do not understand accessibility laws. Even as users complain about the problems with these products, the vendors use astroturfing techniques to drown it out. This is an advertisement for one of the overlay vendors. It is a cartoon of a man at a computer happily exclaiming, finally, my website is up. Two men in suits suddenly appear next to him holding legal papers and say, not so fast. Nice website, but it's not accessible. You've been served. The website owner, now crying, hands up in the air, says, I'm broke now, why bother? In the background, the two men can be seen walking away carrying bags of money. Overlay vendors use fear of lawsuits to sell their product, not a desire to help users. The cartoon is careful not to show disabled people as the villains, but the implication is clear. The laws that protect disabled people will cost you money unless you pay for the vendor's help. One vendor cited that a, quote, silent majority, end quote, of users like the overlay product, and that as a result, the complaints that appear online are only exceptions. Here, Chansey Fleet tweets, the founders of Accessibi are interpreting the complacency of non-disabled customers and the bone deep fatigue of disabled users to mean that a silent majority, their actual words, is grateful for and enjoys, enjoys Accessibi. Let's not be silent then. That was in reply to a tweet from Marco Salsiccio, who says, pretty much as well as citing their silent majority of blind users who approve and test their product, I ran into so many issues just going through their example sites alone, I didn't want to give them a fully free audit of how much they were doing wrong. In addition, these vendors have a history of astroturfing review sites, social media, and the web in general. The effort is to ensure only their message appears and they have the money, SEO chops, and lack of integrity to do it. I have links to Twitter spam, Medium articles, paid promotion pieces at industry sites, questionable reviews on other platforms, even Wikipedia entries that were flagged by the moderators as spam. 
The image here shows a headline from WP Tavern when one vendor one vendor had all the fakes, fake reviews for its plugin removed. In addition to individual complaints, there has been press coverage of these companies. Users with some standing in the disability community have spoken about overlay failures in general. Some users are so frustrated they share tips and tools to block overlays. Two vendors have even threatened users with lawsuits. NBC News ran a story with the headline, Blind People Advocates Slam Company Claiming to Make Websites ADA Compliant. Vice also ran an article headlined, People with Disabilities Say This AI Tool Is Making the Web Worse for Them. The New York Times published one over the summer. For blind internet users, the fix can be worse than the flaws. The Mosin at Large podcast devoted an entire episode to the question of the value of overlays. Episode 105 asked, can AI make the web fully accessible in a few short years, or might it make matters worse? A chunk of a follow-up episode was devoted to more frustrations from users. Other community podcasts have discussed these tools as well. Some users are so frustrated that they have written tools to block overlays. Accessibegone gives instructions for how to block overlays using ad blockers or by editing your host file. Accessibye Bye Bye is a browser extension to disable overlays in the browser. One overlay has opted to fight back. In April 2021, facilities attorneys started sending letters demanding removal of any criticism. Uh, this letter uh, to, I'm probably going to get the name wrong here, pronunciation wrong. This letter to Kona shows two tweets about facility. Kona to, whoops. Kona declined to comply with the request and wrote about why. Another disabled user, who I'm not naming here, but I've shared their plight on Twitter, was subpoenaed to appear in court. Facility had asked for 5,000 euros in damages, 5,500 euros in fines, and in order to cease comments that may, quote, discredit the facility solution, end quote. I cannot think of a better way to prove that your product helps disabled users than by suing disabled people who say it does not. That story got some press in France in Numerana with the uh, machine translated headline, Facility, the solution for online inclusion that refuses criticism. Another overlay vendor threatened a lawsuit for valid criticism, specifically AudioEye. You can read AudioEye's cease and desist letter to me along with my response on my site, which I do believe I link at the end. Overlay vendors also claim that organizations love them, but community and industry organizations have been clear that they do not. National Federation of the Blind, after accepting one as a sponsor for its annual event, went so far as to not only drop the sponsor, but to then issue a statement rebuking its very existence. This part of the statement stood out to me. Quote, in particular, it is the opinion of the board that accessibility peremptorily and scornfully dismisses the concerns blind people have about its products and its approach to accessibility. The nation's blind will not be placated, bullied, or bought off. Therefore, the board revoked accessibility sponsorship of the convention on June 22, 2021. The CSUN Assistive Technology Conference briefly had an overlay on its site and was met with such rapid and vocal anger that it was dropped immediately. It may very well have been implemented without anybody's knowledge. And based on this tweet, which reads, quote, the accessibility overlay has been removed. It was implemented without our approval. The conference does not endorse this product and we apologize for the situation, which has now been corrected, end quote. The Olympic Committee created the We the 15 site in an effort to promote the Paralympics, but in doing so used an overlay. After responses from users in the disability community, the overlay was removed within a couple days. That same overlay is still on the main Olympics website, which may be a function of the vendor promoting it so heavily in its marketing materials. One of the We the 15's tweets in response, quote, thank you for alerting us about these issues. We're disappointed too that we've fallen short in this area. We've gathered together some new experts who are helping us to fix this. It would be great to have your support going forward to make the next iteration a complete success, end quote. Many overlay vendors claim that detractors are really just frustrated competitors. The overlay fact sheet disproves that. Over 750 people have signed it so far. You could sign it after this talk. 
They represent web specification contributors, internal accessibility experts from companies in higher education, lawyers for the disabled, contributors to assistive technology, and end users with disabilities. I encourage you to visit the site at overlayfactsheet.com and read through the information and links. It identifies strengths and weaknesses of overlay widgets and automated repair. It also touches on technical and privacy concerns. In addition to the signatures, there are statements from users. There is one professional organization for digital accessibility practitioners, International Association of Accessibility Professionals, IAAP, is a division of G3ICT, the Global Initiative for Inclusive Information and Communication Technologies. It allows membership for overlay vendors. Overlay vendors then brand their marketing materials with the IAAP logo. Similarly, the W3C allows for anyone to set up an unaffiliated community group. Overlay vendors use these as veneers of credibility. Some organizations display the IAAP logo in their footer. UserWay and Max Access each do so, using the weight of accessibility professionals as a marketing boost. Others might get promoted, I'm sorry, others might get promotional consideration, as AudioEye did when IAAP tweeted an AudioEye post. A post, incidentally, arguably lifted from W3C documents. There was finally some fallout, though, for IAAP. On January 17, a few months ago, IAAP promised a, quote, proactive, end quote, response to that tweet and overlay membership, even though I raised the concern in September along with others, uh, and that's September of 2021. It produced a survey for members and non-members. The results of that survey were posted on Friday, February 25th of this year. Of the 609 responses, 591, 97%, were not overlay vendors. 81% of them, 478 responses, state they do not compete with overlay vendors. 549 responses, or 90%, say they have seen false claims by overlay vendors. And 533 responses, or 86%, believe IAAP should comment on marketing claims in general. Also 90%, 549 respondents, believe IAAP should comment on overlay marketing claims specifically. In May, representatives from UserWay and AudioEye proposed an overlay community group to the W3C and got the votes, approval, and call for participation up in 12 hours. The next day, it deleted the call for participation and sat dormant. Almost a month later, it renamed itself to Accessibility at the Edge and used a novel interpretation of edge computing to justify and obfuscate its purpose. Two months after that, it reposted its call for participation this time framing it as an accessibility community group that just happens to include overlays. And so overlays veneer of a W3C blessing is complete. This community group uh, then got a breakout slot at W3C's Technical Plenary and Advisory Committee or TPOC session in September. There the UserWay COO took three opportunities to promote its own product in this session. This despite every attendee, except for one of the community group's invited guests, voicing their broad opposition to overlays for an hour. As we have seen, overlays cannot make your site or your brand better overnight. Uh, to wrap up this talk, I wanna cover some steps you can undertake without overlays. Plan ahead. Have a drink of water. Excuse me. Plan ahead. Hire a consultant who has some experience in this space. They can help you choose a vendor who prioritizes accessibility and write this into your contracts. They can also direct you to technologies that have been vetted. Some platforms have accessible features already. Uh, last I checked, WordPress offers 114 free accessibility ready themes built with a baseline of compliance already in place. And some free online resources. Um, when you create content, use those resources. They may have all you need to get going. There is even a free tool to generate an accessibility statement for your site provided by the very organization that sets accessibility standards. What if you already have a site? You can use one of the many free automated accessibility checkers on the market, assuming you aren't interested in getting into the browser's own tools. There is ARC, Axe, 
Lighthouse, Wave, and WebHint, among others. While they will not catch all the issues, maybe only about 30%, they will at least give you a sense where you stand. Where you have gaps, document them. Identify what is wrong and put together a plan and timeline to address them. Publish that on your site when you generate an accessibility statement. As long as you honor the timelines you provide, you can choose what your ongoing budget will be to address them, even if it's only $1,000 per year. If you are affected by overlays as a consumer, then you can take some action. In the US, the Federal Trade Commission has rules that advertising must not be deceptive, must include evidence, and cannot be unfair. Overlayfalseclaims.com provides documented examples of overlay vendor false claims, along with comp uh, consumer complaint resources for the US, federal and state, Canada, and New Zealand. You can use information there to file a false advertising complaint. You can also open a PR to submit information for filing complaints in other countries. To wrap up this session, I have posted links to some of the material I referenced throughout. You can get to it by scanning the QR code. No, nope, pointing the wrong way. Scanning the QR code over there. Or by going to the URL, rosel.li slash wpa11y day dash 22. I'm going to say that again because it was sloppy. That's R-O-S-E-L dot L-I slash W-P-A-1-1-Y day dash 22. Um, that's it. Thank you. Feel free to uh, ask me some questions. I think I finished a little bit early. Awkward. Hey, thank you so much, Adrian. Um, that's fascinating. And I actually feel a little bit gross hearing about some of those practices. Um, thank you for educating us. Uh, we've got some great questions coming in. Uh, early on, you mentioned that the text resizer might be used to gather data about how many users want larger fonts. Have you ever seen data on usage of these features like text resize, contrast, or dark mode toggles? I can't find any. And when I look and I suspect custom coding these is not worth the effort. Um. I have had a couple of clients who have um, put widgets on there, like they they rolled their own text resizing widget, which was the example I cited, and they tracked how often people used it. And they took that information, quickly found out their text was too small, and then addressed it. As for pre-existing tools or scripts that do that, you, you pretty much have to custom roll your own for your site, is my guess. That might be a really nifty WordPress plugin for somebody to build. Just saying. There you go. Um, another question for you about IAAP. Is there any update whether they will continue to allow overlay companies to be members who exploit this for credibility? So um, what I like about that question is there are a few different ways I could answer that. I think the simplest is that IAAP hired um, Ken Nakata, contracted Ken Nakata. Uh, I think he's Converge Accessibility to gather information and start to put together um, sort of a, a rough framework for best practices for how members should behave in the marketplace. Um, overlay vendors were included with that, as well as me and some people who've been critical of overlays. Uh, Ken did a great job of keeping us apart from each other. Go, Ken. Um, but that's still in a draft stage, and I I am not an IAAP member. I'm not planning to be one, so I don't I don't have any insight internally on where it is in their uh, final editing or approvals process. Makes sense. Do you think that was a sufficient response from them, or would you have liked to have seen more? I feel that I would have liked to have seen more. I would have liked um, a, a stronger stance prior to allowing the membership. But mm. that's just my personal opinion. My strongly held belief, which is a clause I put in there because of litigious overlay vendors. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Accessibi offers free ADA site testing. I'm assuming we can't trust this testing. What should we use to test our sites? So Great I listed question. a bunch uh, toward the end there. Um, X, WebHint, um, uh, Arc, TPGI's, Arc Product, um, Wave, WebAIMS, Wave. Those are all 
good tools that have some history behind them and the companies that built them have practitioners in there who've been in the space for a long time. The issue with Accessibility's own checker, because I've done some side-by-side -side comparison, is it finds issues I would not flag that map directly to um, uh, map directly to features of their own product. Uh, and mm. they raise issues that aren't really issues. I've documented some of that on my site. And uh, I think some of it's linked from that QR code, which I don't think is displaying anymore. So there's some additional information there. And I'm, cool. I'm good to answer some more questions. I, I don't want us to run over time. Yeah, we've got uh, a few minutes. If you don't mind hanging with me, yeah, people happy to still do have it. questions. Um, can you talk about why you had redacted in your talk? Oh yeah. So um, uh, specifically, I there were there were two vendors. Um, well, three actually. So I had to remove redacted and redacted because redacted. So I opted not to leave them in there because redacted. And then the third vendor was listed in uh, one of the screenshots and um, redacted um, kind of had some issues with that. So I redacted. Okay. That's a lot of, a lot of Sharpies. Yep. <laughs> in, in case, um, in case nobody noticed, there was a whole slide in there where I was sent a cease and desist letter by a highly paid law firm. So yeah, mm -hmm. I am just I one guy. To checking out those slides. Um, okay, so if somebody were to, I don't know how to how to client, or I guess if you had someone that was interested in using an overlay and a consultant was trying to convince a client that that's a terrible idea, um, you have sort of the elevator pitch of how a consultant could describe that to a client. Could describe. The, the risk that, that, they, that they should not use the overlay. Um, so this, this very much depends on the person I'm talking to. Um, overlay vendors have a pretty clear marketing message where they're, um, they're using fear, uncertainty, uh, they're using FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And it's all about threat of lawsuit. So if I identify the person I'm talking to is just trying to avoid lawsuits, I explained to them how easy it is to set up a process to dodge the lawsuit. And by dodge, I mean, do some checks, make some fixes, document what you have to do and do it on whatever timeline, as long as you, you document it. It is startlingly easy to avoid getting sued. It's, it's a lot harder to go through and fix every detail, but you know, Leonie Watson has, has said this uh, famously a couple of times. It's, it's not, it's not about, and I'm horribly paraphrasing it, it's not about getting everything right today. It's just about doing better each day, a little bit better each day. And if a company is committed to it and doesn't look at it as a legal risk, uh, they'll generally be fine. But I, I think the, like my fourth last slide, which I mentioned in the blog post, just a couple, just four quick bullets and you're in good shape. And that's the kind of conversation I have with um, some potentially worried clients. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, here's one, a great question. I'm fairly new to the whole overlays concept. Why did this end up as a growing tech in the first place? And was it ever useful? Um, to answer the second part, evidence suggests they were never useful. Uh, even going back 10 years to browse aloud and some of the others, they weren't useful. They are a growing technology simply because somebody made a business case about Here's how many disabled people are in the world. Here's an entire market we could tap into just by selling this overlay product. And we will pitch it as uh, legal risk mitigation. Mm. That's really it. They didn't have the experience. They didn't understand all the aspects of it, which is evident in the, the tooling. And they got venture funding. And as we know, a lot of businesses that are backed by venture funds aren't necessarily fully fleshed out. In many cases, they're still building the airplane as they're falling out of the sky. And I think mm. that's sort of the scenario that we're seeing here. When you have uh, a startup culture, you know, the, the move fast and break things model doesn't apply to the um, kind of rigor that is necessary for dealing with humans. And accessibility is, is not really a technology problem. It's a human problem. 
So that's where we have it. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, well, we will go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much, Adrian, for sharing your knowledge and sharing your slides. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, and thank you everyone who tuned in for attending this session with Adrian Roselli. You can continue the conversation on chat or social media using the hashtag WPA11Day and WPAD2022. <clears throat> We also really appreciate if you would go to wpaccessibility.day slash feedback to provide anonymous feedback for our speakers on their presentation. And you can also enter to win a free cool t-shirt while you're there. So stay tuned. Up next, we've got Beyond Colors and Captions, how to provide more inclusive accessibility. And that is with Bella Gaitan at 5 UTC. And while you're waiting, don't forget to check out our sponsors pages for cool virtual swag and for a chance to win great prizes. We'll see you right here after the break. Thanks, y'all.